Bit of a tough weekend out there for the Warriors, but all in all, a really awesome experience up there in Napier. Let's take a bit of a look at how the game played out and how their whole experience went down. Hey team, welcome back to the Warrior-holic. A little bit torn today, had an absolutely outstanding experience up in Napier there, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but the game a little bit of a disappointment. So before we get into that, you know, a lot of people are not overly keen on, you know, Warriors games getting taken away from Mount Smart. It's their home, you know, it's the the place we want to build a fortress. But i got to say, I um, haven't been to the Wellington game in round one and up there in Napier this weekend. I found it really awesome to, you know, be in one central location where fans from all over the country come together. You know, fans, content producers, a lot of, um, you know, sponsors, Warriors team, um, support staff, all there in one location, you know, charging around the city. All in our Warriors gear, just really, it's awesome to be a part of a movement like that over a couple of days. You know, Napier really turned it on from a uh, weather perspective. Absolutely mint conditions here, 17, 18 degrees, blue skies, no wind. So it was just a, such a festival feeling to it. Um, shame a few dickheads at the game let it down, um, because I, I think Napier is an ideal location for it, but uh, maybe a bit of a challenge for them to get games going forward after all those pitch invaders. But uh, just a quick shout out to... The Warriors players, um, the OBs, the commercial staff there that I had a chance to have a chat to who gave me their time, thank you very much. Uh, to the guys at SENZ, uh, Uncle Kempe there, Sam Hewitt, and Logan, um, and their support staff for giving me a chance to jump on the cans for the first time. That was a really awesome experience and to meet them in person for the first time. Um, the other creators I ran into, that was really cool, you know, people I've sort of heard or been sp speaking to on, online there but never had a chance to sit down and have a chat with. That was brilliant. And really, you know, classic to run into some of the followers. Um, had a guy, uh, Lance, I think it was, from all the way over from Germany. You know, we had people from Whanganui run into a guy randomly in Palmerston North on the way home who came up and said g'day. So really awesome to see you guys out there enjoying the content. And also just all the fans in general. It's just cool to, you know, sort of connect and you know, share warrior stories, have a beer and the like. So overall, other than the game and the outcome and a few decades run on the field, it was an absolutely mint weekend. So really stoked I went up. Uh, looking forward to getting up to Mount Smart, hopefully in round 20 for the Sharks game to experience a uh, real home game for the Warriors for the first time. I haven't spent half my life living overseas. So this could be the year for the for the Warriors and for the Warrior Holic to experience the full package. And hopefully uh, the first weekend of October for the finals as well, eh? So, getting on to the game. Uh, I'm going to kind of break this down to a couple of key topics. I'm not going to get really detailed in this because I've got to go, go and do a live tonight um, with uh, Warriors NRL Fanatics, which will cover a lot of this in depth. We're going to have a bit of an hour chat, though. First and foremost, Baby Broncos is a myth. They had five guys out for um, Origin. They had one guy, I think, making his NRL debut. So they had a lot of experienced players of, you know, um, played NRL coming in to replace those guys. Um, they still had plenty of talent there, um, particularly in Reynolds, like that guy is world class. And as soon as I knew he was playing, I, I knew it would be in for a tough game. Alternatively, you know, we've got seven guys out at the moment from our first choice lineup. So I think it was a pretty even sort of matchup from that perspective. Neither of us had our top team, so that, you know, sort of that's how it played out on the day. Um, so I just want to dispel that bit of a myth there that it, you know, it wasn't the baby Broncos, it was just two teams with slightly under strength. Now, my impression at the ground, you know, I walked in there and there's a big sort of crowd as you came in. It was really, really hot, but it felt a little bit flat um, once we got in there and got our seats and stuff. And I feel that might be, you know, due to it being um, away from home game, you probably got 30% of really hardcore Warriors fans, maybe 30% of, you know, footy fans in general and sports fans are there for a bit of an occasion. And 30 people just looking for something to do on a weekend, you know, in a, in a town that doesn't have too many things. So... You know, compared to a proper home Warriors game or even in um, Wellington where I felt like we probably had 70% really, you know, passionate supporters, it was a little bit flat, um, but it was still good. It was an interesting size, you know, size ground and so forth, and it was packed out. So that was good, but yeah, once the game kicked off, so the first impression myself and the guys I was sitting with got, we were right on halfway there, really good seats. The boys just seemed out of sync and seemed a little bit flat, and... It was kind of interesting, my perception of the game when I watched it live and then I've actually been back and watched it twice since to try and figure out where the differences lie. It genuinely felt flat throughout the whole game 
until that last sort of 10 minutes where we let loose watching it live. And even then, it would have, you know, kind of felt like a little bit of a disappointment if we pulled it off because I didn't feel we played that well. Um, when I say out of sync, I mean, guys overrunning the passes for dummy half that, you know, half the four passes didn't actually even get called. It's just the one. Um, the runners, the forward runners off Tohu, often overrunning the pass meant he actually had to take the hit up way too, you know, way more often than not, um, ending up doing well over 200 metres purely because the guys weren't linking with him. So um, that's what I mean by out of sync there. You know, you could see Metcalf trying his best to get involved in the game, but it didn't feel like we had a clear plan of how to use him. But the effort was there. Um, Broncos, I think, you know, they played pretty consistent throughout the game and it felt like live they were getting the better better of contact, the better momentum, but actually the stats didn't reflect that. In fact, we had a lot more post-contact metres than they did and ran for more metres. So it was odd because it did really feel like the, the, um, the Broncos had kind of dominated for most of the game, but I think in reality they just managed to convert their opportunities, whereas, you know, we were was it four or five um, times where we got over that line and just couldn't get the ball down. And that's where I really want to give a few props to the Broncos here. I think Adam Reynolds showed that he's probably one of the top two or three halves in the game. It gave, you know, SJ a bit of a lesson there. He didn't have his best night in the first, you know, sort of 60 minutes or so. But Reynolds was, you know, he was just in control the whole way through. I thought he linked really well with Mann. Um, that one-two punch was, was a really, really good combination. Um, I thought their centres both played really, really well in Stags and um, Farnsworth. They put a lot of pressure on SJ um, whenever he was into the first receiver role. When he was kicking, they were just straight up out of the line. Um, whereas I don't think we were able to put the same amount of pressure on um, Reynolds when he was kicking, so he had a lot more time. And as a result, he was actually much more effective with his kicking. Um, I thought Billy Walters played pretty well as well. And, you know, um, Sailor and the young deputon on the wing there. His name escapes me at the moment. So they, they played really, really well. Now for the Warriors. Um... I'm going to base this on actually going back and watching the game now um, and looking at the details. You know, we didn't play as bad as I thought. We were in it more than I realised. We didn't look as flat on TV, but there was definitely that lack of um, you know, continuity and the, the sync wasn't there between our playmakers and the runners. Um, the other thing I noticed is we were really lacking in our support players. We, we were making a lot of tackle breaks and line breaks, but we weren't able to put the next person away, which the Broncos were able to do. Um, we really struggled to defend our errors. You know, the, the Tom Ali one is a classic example. You know, norm normally over this season we would have defended that, but we let it sneak sneak through. I thought there was a bit of a lack of effort in the chase when we, you know, got that intercept when Montoya dropped the ball. To see Ford, you know, an edge-back rower, was the only guy in picture who chased them all the way down. Everyone else, including the backs, they gave up, you know, five or ten metres into the chase. That's not the Warriors of 2023. So something just wasn't quite clicking there, particularly in the first half. Uh, but I thought Rocco Berry and Dallin and CNK all had really strong starts to the game, had you know, and, and that continued throughout the game. But a couple of the guys just, like I said, seemed a little bit flat. Now, there are a couple of turning points um, for me in the game. Right around the sort of 10, 15 minute into the second half period, all of a sudden, the Broncos stopped being able to get back on side. They had hands on knees. And you could see that that strong Warriors finish was coming. And the guys I was sitting, I was sitting with, you know, we always had the faith that the Warriors would have the gas at the end of the game to run them down. But what happened? The mugs stuck jumping on the field and gave the Broncos effectively like you know, 10, 15 minute water breaks every five minutes or so. So we weren't able to fatigue them right until that last 10 minutes. And I think that's one of the key factors that we didn't get that done. We couldn't really fatigue them the way we wanted to. And I genuinely believe watching that game from the sidelines and seeing what the Broncos were looking like, if that hadn't happened, that flick of the switch from the Warriors would have probably come 20 minutes before the end rather than 10 minutes before the end. It would have given us ample time to run them down. But no, that didn't quite happen. So how did we actually go about flicking the switch? So what I noticed a lot throughout the first half particularly, is Tohu gets a lot of ball as first receiver, and he's playing that rank link role. Um, and by the time the ball gets into Sean Johnson's hands, we're getting quite lateral. The defense is right up in his face. Um, 
you know, similarly, I think it's around the second and third tackles, we're often going to tohu and then he'll bump a pass off to a prop run or a second row running off his shoulder. Whereas in that last 10 minutes, we went back to that philosophy we had against the Sharks, where it was very direct, hard, confrontational running for the first two, three tackles to get that momentum going. Then we started to spin it on the third tackle, and it was going directly to Sean Johnson as the first receiver, two or three wide of the ruck, giving him so much more time and space to play with before the defence was up in his face. As a result, the ball that got to Metcalf or to the centres was in such better position, and they were able to use their creativity and put their, their wingers away. So um, well, I'm not 100% sure. I guess it's just putting a bit of indecision in the defence's mind by having those little forward-to-forward -forward offloads or having Tohu as the um, the link player for those block plays. But I think we showed our strength is when we just get those really solid runs, really aggressive and... Um, in the tackle and fast plays the ball like little pop passes straight off the shoulder of the the hooker one after the other after the other until we get to the third play and then we use the third and fourth play to spin it wide get the momentum and then you're really in a good position to either spin it or kick it on the last tackle i'd love to see us employ that tactic a little bit earlier the other key thing for me is once we started to get that momentum on and you could see that the the broncos are on the back foot I think it was about eight minutes before the end, Metcalf jumped right in there and just took the first pass from the dummy half. And with a um, you know, tired four pack there, he just breezed past the markers and made an easy 20 or 30 metres. That's a role I really want to see from him, is playing that role like um, Reese Walsh does, lurking around the place, similar to as Chance does. Chance makes a lot of metres with those quick feet right around the ruck when you've got them on the back foot. Whereas we found a lot of times that Metcalf was getting the ball sort of one or two wide the de defence up on him, that there was nothing he could really do creative creatively as far as his passing game goes. We, he was having to try and take the line on when it was set, um, and he got smoked quite a bit. So, you know, I think there's a little bit to learn from that, and I think it'll be very different this week coming up. So, you know, it was very frustrating to lose. I think we had that to win. Um, I think the Broncos were better than we expected, but we, we, we should still have beaten them. You know, I'd love to go through all of the stats, but the only stats they beat us on was um, completion. We had 70 to 80 percent kicking meters. Reynolds kicked for about 200 more meters. And that was a result of the pressure they were putting on SJ, which shortened up his kicking game. Every other stat we beat them on: Com um, tackle efficiency, um, line breaks, tackle breaks. Um, you know, less missed tackles. Basically the same amount of area, same amount of possession. Everything that indicated we should have won that game. But the Broncos executed on the few chances they got and we weren't able to. So it shows we can create. Um, a year or so ago, or even last year, that game would have been a blowout and we would have got done by 40. So I'm really proud of the boys to actually you know, effectively win that or go close to winning it in the last minute if Pompey hadn't grabbed that jersey. So I'm not going to jump all over him because that game was effectively lost well before it got to that silly move by him. So next week, I think it's a very different challenge up against the Dolphins. Um, they won't let us get away with all of the mistakes that we made this week. Um, they'll be much more methodical. That said, hopefully we get Mitch Barnett back. Hopefully we get Willie Army back and potentially um, Egan and Tamari Martin as well. If Egan doesn't come in with Lusick out for 11 days, I'm not sure what they do at, um, at hooker. Probably see one of the younger guys come up. But watching Roach and the like have been playing hooker in reserve grade, I'm not sure that they're really up for first grade. So I'm really hoping Egan comes back. I think if we could get Tamati Martin in, he really shores up our chasing and our um, effort game. Similarly, if we can get Mitch Barnett back into that um, front row, even if it's off the bench, he'll give us a lot more muscle up there. Um, I'd love to see Williami come in. I watched him, went back and watched him play against the Knights. He's such a solid player. Great speed, great defense, great ability to, to position his players outside them and put them away. Um, to be honest, I think I'd probably drop Pompey and uh, keep Rocco Berry. Pompey's got some really good um, efforts on attack. We've seen his little slight step and his ability to you know, set his wingers up, but I think he's got a few... Um, effort area is missing there in defence and I think Rocco Berry is just very very solid his tactic, tackling technique was outstanding um, you know his ability to turn and catch a guy and legs tackle him if he's beaten on the outside 
couple of times their um, Farnsworth got past him, but he was the one to make the tackle. That wouldn't have happened with Pompey. So I'd really like to see Rocco get a lot more time. Um, I think he's one of our centres for the future. So be curious to see how it plays out, but we're going to have to start a heck of a lot better. We're going to have to finish our opportunities. We're going to have to have a little bit more luck with these injuries because we just can't keep competing with these top teams with such a depleted squad. But, you know, frustrating as it was, it was, you know, it was a really enjoyable weekend. Um, I think a lot of people who've never had a chance to experience the Warriors firsthand would have got a chance. There'll be kids out there who'll probably become Warriors fans because of that. So all in all, great experience. Looking for a big step up next week. We're still in the eight, but if we lose another couple, we could drift out of contention really, really quickly. So for me, it's a must win for these next two games against the, the Finns and against the Dragons. Then we go on to another bye. Six points in a row. That really cements us up in that top eight. I'm all in with the Warriors. A little bit disappointed, but still fired up to see how we go against the Dolphins. Let's go.